Welcome to another episode of BTWN News. My name is Tim. I'm the BTWN guy, and you're watching BTWN News here on YouTube. Today is July 30, 2022, and be, pre be prepared to be offended. I'm prepared to lose subs today, <laughs> subscribers. Maybe that'll happen. I'm uh, going to talk about pacifism, Hitler, an article written by the Gospel Coalition, and I'm going to give some feedback and answer a question about Calvinism and lordship salvation. So it should uh, be quite controversial. If you appreciate what I'm doing here, and if you are a man, uh, and or if you're a man, uh, stay tuned to the end because I got something extra for you I want to share with you. All right, here's the article written at Protestia. Uh, Protestia, pa pacifist, the Gospel Coalition, writer says the world should have let Hitler and Nazis conquer unopposed. Are you a pacifist? Do you know any pacifists? Many times I have identified based on the definition of some people's understanding as a pacifist. Struggled with the fact of being a pacifist. I have friends who are strong, hardline pacifists. I have friends that are so anti-pacifist, they don't want anything to do with me sometimes because of it. It's a very tough topic because the argument that the TGC writer makes is biblical. So let's look at it. Uh, this is what they wrote at Protestia. Andrew Wilson is a frequent contributor to the Gospel Coalition. He also is a teacher, pastor at King's Church. Let me make that bigger for you. And the author of God of All Things, Rediscovering the Sacred in Everyday World. During his good faith debate with Bob Thune on how should Christians think about gun control and the right to bear arms, Wilson who is an extreme pacifist, claimed that the world should not have opposed Hitler, Hitler's military, but rather should have let him conquer the world. And here is the text of the video I'm going to play for you now. <clears throat> I say I'm a pacifist, but I am a concealed carry pacifist and probably wouldn't be in the same category as this individual. But I'm interested in what you think. MacArthur has said that <clears throat> the uh, American Revolution should have never happened. That um, the those who came to America and they were uh, going against what the government wanted when they did that. So the uh, American Revolution was something, I think, I think MacArthur's on record saying that that was an ungodly act, the foundation of America. Uh, perhaps you know more and can shed light on it. Uh, you can leave your comment below. But let's listen to this man's argument about um, this topic. Um, in World War II, from what I understand, reading of history, one of the Axis powers were very concerned about how in the world you would invade the United States because of how many private citizens owned uh, guns and ammunition. Um, how how does that part of the debate land with you? Because he made that argument. It's one that's circulating now. I'm curious how yeah. you respond to that. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think World War II is the, the closest thing we have to a, 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 ge a genuine war of good against evil, right? And I, I think probably most wars in history say, oh, there's, you know, there's bad men on both sides, there's good men on both sides. I, I think when you have Hitler and Nazis and wanted to steamroll everybody, you'd go, okay, that's a, I think we're as close as we can be to saying that's a very, very bad man and a lot of very bad, bad things are going to happen if he's in charge. But I, and so as that sense, it follows us, it's like the reductio ad absurdum of the pacifist position. And I think you, as a pacifist, you, you basically swallow it and you say, yeah, that might mean Britain had been invaded. It might, I might now be speaking German, maybe. I think the world will be. I have to trust the, the providence of God. I have to. I, I have to ultimately say this is exactly what Romans twelve is doing, saying you don't do these things because vengeance is mine. It's mine to repay. And I think in the Sermon on the Mount, don't re, again. I think if you read the Sermon on the Mount and say, "What does this say I should do with Hitler?" You'd go, "Yeah, I think that means you might have to say I don't resist." And 
And, and at that point, you might say, oh, that's cowardice. I think I actually think that takes a lot of courage to hold that position. He's he's absolutely right that it takes. He's absolutely correct that it takes a lot of wherewithal of guts, so so to say, to hold that position because not a lot of people like him because of that position. If you read the Sermon on the Mount and you think, what, what should I do in regards to um, military action or, you know, protecting ourselves or interaction with those that want to bring physical harm or take over a country, a lot to be said, and I've only skimmed to the top of it, but this article is uh, also shared in other, this video has been shared in multiple articles in um, our circles of theology. So I thought I would play it for you and ask you, what, what do you think? Um, I do think that there is, it would be very different if you were not an American. Like I know a very strong pacifist who lives in Canada and Canada is a totally different thing than America, much different than America. But um, I know other pacifists are on different levels of pacifism. Um, but uh, we've had, I think we've had debates here on this YouTube channel. And uh, it is a sticky, sticky situation. <laughs> it is uh, a touchy subject. Um, yeah. But yeah, you have to check your Americanism at the door when you read scripture. I'm not saying you have to be a pacifist, but I'm saying that some of us, when we read the scriptures and we consider them, our Americanism uh, affects it, it uh, comes into play. All right. My last video was the most glorious reality. Uh, be encouraged. And in it, John MacArthur said that um, one of the most glorious realities is that Jesus Christ holds you today. He holds you firm in your salvation. And if it was you that was holding on to your salvation, you would lose it. And on that video, I got the following comment. And I wanted to weigh in on this comment. I wanted to answer it and um, share it with you and give you an opportunity to comment on this video as well. So Ben says, I understand what MacArthur is saying. However, the Calvinistic and Lordship salvation position cannot produce assurance. Calvinism and Lordship cannot produce assurance. Hmm. He says, I read the, read the book by John MacArthur titled Saved Without a Doubt. Now, I haven't read that book, but he has. And he says, the problem with Calvinism is that it asks us to believe, he asks us as believers to check for fruit of or, or good works. So Cal, the problem with Calvinism, says Ben, is that Calvinism asks us to check for good fruit. So if what John MacArthur is saying is true, that we base our assurance on Christ holding us, then what about looking for good works? Well, let me let me kind of refute that for you, um, Ben, because Ben says Calvinism asks us to check for fruit or good works. Well, if by Calvinism you mean the Bible, um, I would agree with you. This is uh, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in, is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that you have not failed the test. Okay. So Paul's writing, and he says exactly what John MacArthur says. Check yourself. Check for fruit. How are you doing? So it's not Calvinism, Ben, unless you mean the Bible. Um, going on, 
is that not the same thing as basing your assurance on what we do? Now, here I'll, I might point out that assurance of salvation is different than evidence of salvation. That's an important point. Assurance of salvation and evidence of salvation are two separate topics, subjects. And it, you need to understand which, which of those topics we're discussing. It says, I believe that Calvinism and Lordship salvation to be completely contrary to Scripture. And when I read that, I thought, oh, good. I hope he gives me an example. And he does. For example, the book of 1 John tells us that we can know we have eternal life. But what those who are backsliding or struggling with sin? It's unfortunate that he typed it that way because I don't know exactly what he means. Maybe he means, but what about those who are backsliding or struggling with sin? If so, the that verse is not being truthful. I'm, let's go. Let's go to. Uh, and he didn't give a specific verse in First John, so we'll look at a couple of them. All right. First, we'll look at um, <clears throat> First John five eleven. This is the testimony, and this is the testimony God has given to us eternal life. This life is in the Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Perhaps this is the verse that Ben was talking about, so that you may know you have eternal life. But then he asks, what about those who are backslidden? Um, here's something in the beginning of the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and declared to you, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we lie, and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us for our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. One thing that we need to make clear once again is that lordship salvation and Calvinism does not hold that the, that the Christian becomes sinless. And Ben, I don't think you're arguing for sinless perfectionism. But we're on the same page as what Scripture says. Scripture says you can know that you're saved. You can have assurance of your salvation. Okay? And then it also says at the same time, there's evidence of that salvation. You can see evidence of salvation. Scripture is consistent and the doctrines of grace I believe, are the same as well. Okay, the problem with Calvinism is that it, it makes God into a horrible being. And at least Calvinism is completely wrong. At the most, it distorts God and ultimately does not offer hope to the lost. Why doesn't Calvinism offer hope to the lost? Ben, why doesn't the Calvinist reads scripture and presents the gospel the same way the anti-Calvinist does. We're, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. You've broken God's law. This is the way the Calvinist and the non-Calvinist who believes the gospel, they, they both present the gospel and say, you're a sinner. You're condemned to hell unless you trust Christ as your savior in Christ's life, death, burial, and resurrection, and the payment that he paid on the cross for uh, your sins. It's only through the work of Christ. It's not your own works. It's the work of Christ. It's all been done by Christ, and all you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will be saved. Calvinists and non-Calvinists both 
present the gospel that way or can if they choose. So why doesn't, why would one offer hope and one not? They're, they, they have the same gospel. They're, they have the same presentation. I'm wondering, Ben, what you meant by that. All right, so I responded to Ben's comment with a video. And this video here that I sent him is this one, MacArthur's Top Three Controversial Teachings. And I go through um, stating that number three is is, uh, dispensationalism, number two is Calvinism, and number one is Lordship Salvation, which I make arguments for uh, Lordship Salvation, and I read Pastor John's comments about Lordship Salvation. And his comment response to that was, those scriptures are based on exegetical emphasis on Calvinist theology. Those who hold the free will, free grace, do not view said scriptures from the perspective of Calvinists. You'd you'd really have to go through each one um, to prove that point, because I disagree with you. Why would a loving God send, this is like totally different um, argument, but that Ben wants to make, and I'm glad he made it. Why would a loving God send only some to heaven and pass over others or preordained those to hell? Sounds like a fatalistic and determinalistic theology. It kind of does. I'm glad you asked, because God answers that question. God knew that you'd wonder, so he answered that question. And here it is in Romans chapter 9. Paul says, not only that, but Rebecca's children were conceived at the same time by their father Isaac. Yet, before the twins were born and had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. Yet it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? What what, what then shall we say? Is God unjust? No, not at all. For Moses says, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on those I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on those that I will have compassion. It doesn't, I don't even have to add anything to these scriptures. They're they're They speak for themselves. I don't, I don't have to exegete them at all. All I have to do is read them. It does not therefore depend on human desire or human effort, but on God's mercy. For scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he has mercy. Excuse me. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens those that he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? But you, but who are you, O human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some, some for common purposes? And here's the ultimate answer to your question. What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath, prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us, whom he also called, 
not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. You can read on. If you wish, Romans chapter 9. Very eye-opening, Ben. Um, if that passage seems like a deterministic, fatalistic God, if that's your de if that's your definition of a fatalistic God, and a God that you won't you won't worship or have as yours, a God who chooses, a God that says that hey, it's up to me and not man what I do with you. You're, you're but a pot of clay. You're like a lump of clay, and I'm going to do whatever I want to do with you. And <laughs> if you want to talk back to me. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? My suggestion to people like Ben is don't 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 wrestle with that scripture. Submit to that scripture. Submit to it. And realize that we are but little peons on this earth that God created for his purposes. And he's going to do whatever he wants to do with us. Pacifist Hitler and the Gospel Coalition. Calvinism, Lordship, Salvation. Hey, thanks for sticking around. If you appreciate what I'm doing here, um, click on the link in the description of this video. There's three different ways that you can support this ministry. One is to send a check. Uh, physical address is there. One is to support on Ko-Fi and another is to give on Patreon. That's that donate button, not Patreon. Got banned on Patreon. Inappropriate. I have singled out a protective group of individuals and I am no longer welcome on Patreon. Uh, this is PayPal. They haven't figured out who I am yet. So until PayPal figures out who I am, you can donate there and, uh, we're keeping Ko-Fi in the dark, but um, please consider doing that. Much appreciated. And if you're a man and uh, you you love God and would like to be encouraged and encourage others, consider the Builders Summit. It's coming up real soon. Actually, tomorrow's the last day you can register under the early bird registration. Um, $175 um, for the entire thing. That's that's the equal to one night in a hotel room at another conference. For 175, you get room, two nights, six, all your meals, all your snacks, all your activities, the and the conference, all the fellowship, everything, everything, just 175 dollars. Wonderful fellowship, wonderful time of learning and encouraging one another. You will not be disappointed. If you are, I'll give you your money back. There you go. I'll give you your money back. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if you haven't already. Share the content. Give thumbs up. Comment. Helps the al algorithm for YouTube and all that. And um, thanks for watching. Appreciate you guys.